Shalom, shalom, my Havarim. Greetings, my YouTube mishpaha. What's up, my people? And welcome or welcome back to Bible and a Bicycle. My name is Will, and I'm an aspired follower of Yeshua HaMashiach. You might know him as Jesus Christ. I asked everyone out there last week, I published a little video about Brad Scott, some of his teachings, in a casual interview for Matt, and I asked everyone if they enjoyed Brad's teachings and were interested in seeing more from him. And the response was overwhelming. Everyone said they dug Brad and they'd love to see more of his work. So in an effort to introduce folks out here on the interwebs to Brad Scott, and in hopes of preserving and promoting his ministry work, which was a huge influence on my early walk with Yeshua, I decided to make some of these here little videos featuring Brad. Check out that description down below. We go in a little bit more depth about who Brad was. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brad Scott as we talk about the foundation, what that means, what it's all about. So without any further ado, Brad Scott. Shalom, my name is Brad Scott, and I'm going to take you on a journey through the ancient Hebrew language from the end to the very beginning, which according to Isaiah, Yeshahu in the Hebrew, is where the end is located, right, off the, right out of the beginning. Now, some of you are probably saying to yourself, oh no, another Hebrew teacher on prime time. Well, I think you're going to find that the way I teach this language to you, the dynamics of how it works, is going to be much different than something you are used to. I'm going to take it back to its simplicity in the very beginning. And before we begin, there's a couple of things I want to ask you all to do for me. Two things I want you to keep in mind. Number one, we know scientifically, we know according to hard empirical science, that the more you laugh, the longer you live. And so I hope we can have some fun on these programs. And even if you don't think I'm funny, laugh anyway. It's just going to benefit you. Okay, now the second thing I want you all to do for me is I want everybody to agree with me before we begin these programs that God is smarter than we are. If we can all agree that God is smarter than we are, then everything is going to be downhill uh, from there. Now, I've been teaching ancient Hebrew for over 25 years now. It's a passion of mine. I take the language back to what the words meant when they first started in the beginning. I take them back pictographically, and I take them back to some simple little things that you will remember as we go through this program. I teach what's called agrobiolinguistics. I'll say that again, agrobiolinguistics. And that's just a way of saying that language, that is linguistics, words, in your Bible, all of them from Genesis to Revelation are revealed in agriculture and biology. Now see, the sovereign God of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, sovereignly chose to reveal his word with words. That's what we have laying in front of us with our Bibles. God has sovereignly chose that he's going to reveal his word using words. So we ought to know what the words mean. So we're going to take these ba things back to simple agricultural pictures. See, you and I live in a Greek culture. and We're going to talk about the difference between Greek thinking and Hebrew thinking as well. But you and I are brought up in a culture where many of our religious principles and the is, is, is based upon theology. Many of the things are abstract terms. But Hebrew will always take it back to something concrete, something I can experience with my five senses, senses, something I can taste and touch and feel and smell and so forth. And that's the beauty of this language, agrobiolinguistics. When we go back to the beginning, this is going to be God's signature on his creation. When we go back to the beginning, we see that God chose to begin all things with the natural things of creation. Remember Paul said that that which comes first is natural, then that which is spiritual. That which has come first is seen, then that which is unseen, if you will. And so since we can't see the unseen things, and God knows that because he's smarter than we are, since we can't see the unseen things, 
He's revealed the unseen in the seen. And we'll go through lots of examples of that. And so when we go back in our text to the beginning, we see that God began not with man. Man's not till the sixth day of the creation ladder, if you will. God began in the beginning with seeds and flowers and trees and water and sky and ground and dirt. That's how God began all things in the very beginning. And he also, when he created man and the animals, he be, in other words, he began with life. Animal life, plant life, and human life. And I submit to you, and this will become abundantly evident as we go through these, I submit to you that everything you read in your New Testament, every word in your New Testament is found embedded in those, the meaning of it is found embedded in the natural things in the beginning. I submit to you that there's nothing new in the New Testament. It's just true. It's not new. It's just true. If many of us knew the beginning, we would know that it was not true. But see, that's one of the things, the dangers of what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did in the centuries preceding the Messiah coming is that they, they added to the Torah, they added to the revelation of these things uh, from the very beginning, and they took away from them. Remember, God said several times in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32, for example, do not add to my word and do not take away from my word. Why? Because God already knows from the beginning, because he's smarter than we are, that all of his words are embedded in those things in the very beginning. Do not add to the picture. Do not take away from the picture. Of course, by the time the Messiah comes, the Pharisees or the religious system, the Jewish leaders and so forth, had added to the word of God and they took away from the word of God. And so if the Messiah is the living Torah, the living word of God in the flesh, so the perfect pattern of the word of God is standing there in front of them, and if they added to the written word of God and took away from it, which was a picture of the word of God in the flesh, no wonder those guys did not get along. No wonder Yeshua did not get along with the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they had manipulated and corrupted his word, which was a picture of him. So no wonder they didn't recognize the Messiah. I submit to you that everything is in the beginning because see, in our culture, we have religiously, because many of us are brought up in a religious culture in America, we have been taught uh, Greek views of the scriptures and so forth, and we've been taught that the beginning was done away with. Many of us have been taught that because of the, of the crucifixion of Yeshua 2,000 years ago, that he uh, rendered obsolete the Torah and all the words of God. But I submit to you, everything in the Bible is found in the opening chapters of Genesis. So I'll make it very clear to you. Every teaching, every doctrine, every desire, every will and purpose of God, every prophecy from the Father is revealed and in the opening chapters of Genesis. The first four chapters of Genesis contain everything in the scriptures because the opening chapters of Genesis are like a seed. Everything's in the seed. And when you start reading Genesis chapter 5 and 6 and 7, you start reading about the life of Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and patriarchs and so forth, you'll see a repetition, a retelling in the lives of Noah and the patriarchs and Moses and the prophets and even into the New Testament. Embedded and written into those, their lives is the same thing that God already revealed in the opening chapters of Genesis. Now, why did God do that? A couple of reasons. Number one, you all agreed that God was smarter than we are. Remember we said that. The second reason he did that is because of John 3.16. God so loved the whole world. Because he loved the whole world, he gave all the truth in the beginning before the world comes into existence. He didn't do it halfway. He didn't do it starting in Matthew 1, 1 or Acts chapter 2. He revealed all the truth in the very beginning. And the more you understand and see this ancient language, as we take it back, the more you're going to see that beautiful picture that I'm, that I'm trying to paint for you. Now, remember that in the beginning was the word. Okay? Many of us have been not, not been taught of the beginning. And so as we take these pictures back, we're going to see that every word in your Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, once again, is found embedded in these simple agricultural pictures. Now you can see on your screen a very familiar verse now. And that is, Yes, Yahoo, that's how we say it in Hebrew. Yes, Yahoo, 46 verse 10. That is Isaiah. Now in your King James Bibles, it says something like, God declares the end from the beginning. I have translated a couple of these phrases just like you see them here. 
because we have been taught that that is a declaration of the fact that God knows the difference between the end and the beginning. But I submit to you in Hebrew, it says something far more profound than that. Here's what it says. It says, Magid Mereshit Achrit. Isaiah 46.10 says that God declares out of the beginning, the end, and out of ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He declares out of the beginning, the end, and out of ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Now that is one of six other times that Isaiah is going to say basically the same thing. Seven times in the book of Isaiah, he says something very similar to this, and that is simply this that God declares the end right out of the beginning. That's, so that's far more profound than the fact that God knows the end from the beginning. Of course, we know that. Now, what's interesting about that is I submit to you that probably those of you listening to me right now understand that God declares the end out of the beginning now. The believers of the God of Israel know that, but I submit to you that the enemy, the adversary, the devil, the beast, the antichrist, whatever you want to call him, the bad guy, he also knows that the end is declared right out of the beginning. He knows that. He knows that in the end, in the New Testament, there is a record of his demise. And where is that revealed at, according to Isaiah? Right out of the beginning. See, I take Isaiah for every word that he says, because I see abundantly everywhere in everything that I see. And you'll understand it as we go through this. So I submit to you that he also knows the end is revealed right out of the beginning. So I submit something to you. If you were the devil, if you were the adversary, and you hated the seed of the woman, and you hated his people, and you knew that the end was revealed out of the beginning, what would you do? I submit to you that you would keep God's people away from the beginning, because in the beginning is the revelation of the end. And I'm also going to submit to you, for 2,000 years, that plan of keeping God's people away from the beginning has worked very well. It's worked, it's worked very well. It's been a good plan, and it's worked well from the, uh, from the beginning. And so that's why he keeps God's people away from the beginning, by convincing them that the beginning was done away with. The beginning is now irrelevant. We don't need those things anymore. We're children of the New Testament. We don't need that, all that Old Testament Jewish law Torah stuff. And I submit to you that everything is in the very beginning, and that the enemy's desire is to keep man away from the very beginning. So everything that we do is going to be based upon that simple premise. Now, you'll notice once again that in the beginning, God does not start with man. Man is on the sixth day. He's kind of down the creation ladder a bit. And instead, God starts with the seeds and the plants and the trees and the field and so forth. Now, you know why he does that? He does that because he created us. Remember, we all agree he's smarter than we are. He created us and he knows that, that what man is like. He knows what plants and the trees are like. The fundamental difference between the creation, the rocks, the trees, the hills, the water, the seeds, the flowers, and so forth, and man, is that man is infused with choice, and the flowers in the field are not. As you read your Bible, you see that the flowers in the field and, and, and the natural things of creation worship God instinctively. They work, work, worship Him naturally. The trees in the field clap their hands. Psalm chapter 19 says, the creation declares the glory of God, and it goes out through all the ends of the earth, and that there's no voice, no speech, or no language on this planet in which their voice, whose voice? The creation, the things that God created, where their voice is not heard. Psalm chapter 19, read it. Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. And so that's one of the reasons why Paul's going to tell us later that no man, because of that, stands before God with any excuse. Now, see, man is infused with choice. You and I are given the ability... If we choose, and I hate to say this, but most people get up every day on this planet and choose to tell the God of Israel to take a hike. They choose to get up and not worship God. They worship some other God. They worship some other kind of system, but they don't worship the God of Israel. Now, once again, God knew that. God's smarter than we are. So we already knew that men, given the choice, would not worship him, most of them. And so what did he do? He took the meaning of his words... Now, remember, he loves the whole world, so he wants to teach his children these truths. And so, since he knows that the creation worships him naturally, I submit to you that every word in your Bible, 
even all the long theological terms and hard to understand words, every word from Genesis to Revelation, the meaning of those words are found in flowers and trees and fruit and seeds and water and sky and a head, a hand, a knee, a liver, a foot. That's the biological part of it, agrobiolinguistics. All words are found in their meaning embedded in agriculture and biology. Now, why did God do that? Because he knew everybody could relate to those things. He's a loving God. He loves us and he cares about us. And so he put them in things that we naturally see all the time so we would have no excuse. See, it would have been a really bad idea, for example, if God would have given only his word to Japanese accordion players, for example. Now, what would, he, what would, would have happened if he would have only placed his word in the hands of Japanese accordion players? He severely limited himself. Why? There's not very many Japanese accordion players. The Japanese people that I know are smart enough not to play accordions. But that's another story. The purpose and the focus that I'm doing with this is to show you that God used the natural things of creation that everybody could see and everybody could relate to. Because the last time I checked, God knew that he could put one, uh, many of the meanings of the words that we talk about in English in the meaning of a head and a hand in our bodies. You know why God put the meaning in our bodies? Because he created us and he knew that almost everybody on the planet has a body. See how smart God is? He already knew that almost everybody in the world has a head. And so he put the meaning of the words in those kind of things from the very beginning. Okay, I submit to you once again that all of God's purpose and desire and will and prophecy is found embedded in the natural things of creation in the opening chapters of Genesis. Now, the next thing you see on your screen, I know that looks a little odd to some of you, but look at this picture for a few minutes. Let's focus on this for a little bit. I submit to you that every single word in your Bible is found embedded in a house, a family, and a piece of land. This picture may look familiar to some of you. Every word in your Bible is found embedded in that simple little picture right there. Now, once again, why did God do that? He's smarter than we are. If I took little kids from Japan, from Australia, from South America, from Africa, from Odessa, from Canada, if I took little two-year-old kids, no matter where I took them in the world, and I set them all down at a table and gave them a crayon and a piece of paper and I said, draw me something. No matter where the people lived on the planet, every little kid would draw a picture very similar to what you're looking at right there. That picture right there. No matter where the children came from. See, God knew that every little child could relate to this simple little picture because that's a kid's life. That's what the children's life looks like. It's their mommy and their daddy and their home and the trees and the field outside the window. That's something God already knew. And so he embedded all things in that. Let me submit something else to you. Of all the words and all the letters in your Bible, of all the words and letters in your Bible, God sovereignly chooses to begin all the words in Revelation of his written word in his word to us with the letter bet, with the letter bet. The very first letter of scripture is a bet. Now, why did God begin with a bet? Well, there's lots of reasons, but the main reason is simply this. The Hebrew letter bet represents the house. God begins with a house. Now, why does he start out the scriptures with the house? Because he knows everybody can relate to a house. Let me give you an example. Some of you have perhaps, uh, perhaps many of us who probably watch too much TV, but some of you have perhaps watch shows like Lost and Survivor and shows like this. I'm familiar with a couple of them. But, but the premise of these kind of reality TV shows that we're watching lately, if you remember, is that they take a bunch of people and they put them on a plane or stick them on a boat. And what do they do? They take them to some deserted island somewhere and they dump the people off. All kinds of people in all kinds of walks of life, they dump off on an island somewhere. And let me ask you something. What What's the first thing that people instinctively do when they're on the island? Find shelter. Build a house. See, God created us. He already knew that that would be the first thing people would do was look for those kind of things. Now, see, here's the problem. Most of our understanding of the Bible 
is filtered through what we call systematic theology. It's filtered through the system by the time we get it. And the Greek culture that we live in is inundated with abstract thinking. We don't think in concrete terms uh, like Hebrew does. And so we're not trained to think that way. Uh, excuse the phrase, but we have a whole lot of pinheaded intellectuals that are, for the most part, have been removed from the natural things of creation in the beginning and living in high ivory towers somewhere. And we're not focusing on the heart of the country where things are grown and, there, and there's flowers and trees and so forth. When I go speak in New York or Boston or someplace like that, I have to speak differently than I do to those of us in the heart of the country. Because sometimes in those big cities, you know, places where people were piled up on top of each other and the only thing they know about life is cars and steel and metal and smog and and noise. And some of them have gone a couple of generations and have never even seen a flower grow. They don't even know what I'm talking about. I have to talk completely different because most of our culture is so far removed from the simple natural things of creation that meant everything to Abraham and Noah and Isaac and, and, and Jacob and so forth. The simple things of life, they intimately uh, w were related to and everything that they did. Bees and, and flowers and trees and the water and the ability to rain, okay, because we're going to talk about what those words mean later, is very essential to the people in the beginning. But most of us today take it for granted. Most of, we're raising a whole generation of kids that think that, that the lights come forth from the plug in the side of the house. Food comes from the refrigerator or a grocery store and things like that. So far removed from where things happen that many of us don't even realize where they actually come from. If I ask the average kid today, what phase of the moon is there at, at the sky at night? You know what some kids would say? Uh, there's a moon, okay? I mean, what phase of the moon? If I, asked, if I asked the average kid, what kind of tree is growing in your front lawn or your backyard? Some of them would go, we have a tree in the front lawn, okay? Why? We're raising a whole generation of people that are just doing this, okay? They're just sitting around looking at computers and so forth, and they don't even know what's going on outside the window. And that, and that of course, is a very, a very sad thing. But I believe in the latter days, God has told us from the very beginning that he's going to begin to restore all these things back in the latter days. I submit to you that Daniel, excuse me, Daniel chapter 12 is happening before our very eyes. That the, uh, that the books have been unsealed and that there's an explosion of knowledge going on in the last days. I submit to you that when you understand just the basic fundamentals of this beautiful language that we're going to get into soon in, the, in this series, then you're going to see beautiful treasures in the text like you have never seen. You're going to see stuff come up out of the ground that you would never see in Greek or English or even Aramaic many times, but you'll see it in this beautiful language called, called Hebrew. It's like, go, it's like opening up a whole new field of treasures. So these were things that were always there in the first place. I'm going to show you treasures that were always in the ground. It's just that God has sovereignly chose right now, as you're listening to my voice, he has sovereignly chose to bring them to light for just such a time as this. We are living in a generation when God, in which God is going to reveal things that have always been there see the seeds, if you will, have always been in the field. They're now going to come, come up out of the ground. Why? Because God knows it's time. That's why. We're going to talk about things that your grandmother never knew. And that's because it wasn't time for your grandmother to know. It wasn't time for my grandmother to know these things. But God is revealing them now. Why? Because I believe the end is near. The end is close, and God has chosen sovereignly that now I'm going to bring these things up out of the ground. As we, as we go back to the beginning and trace everything in the end right out of the beginning. Because according to Isaiah, once again, seven times he says that is where the end is located. Now, you'll see on your screen Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. You're all familiar with this place, with this verse. It says, the language and culture of Scripture, I submit to you, is born from natural observable facts. Everything you want to know about what's in the Bible, God has embedded in the natural observable facts. That is the creation. That's why the creation is so important, and Yeshua always points back to the creation. The Father always back, points back to the beginning. Someone will confront him with something, and he'll say, yes, but in the beginning it was not so. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. In Hebrew, we say, Ivrim. Ivrim 11, verse 1 says this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. Now, I want you to look at this verse and see something. That's why I've underlined these two words. Notice that faith is not the thing hoped for, and faith is not the thing that's not seen, which is traditionally what you and I are taught in religious circles. Oh, it's just some kind of blind thing out there that we're following and so forth. According to the writer of Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. It's something I can taste and touch and feel and smell and experience with my five senses, not the thing that's not seen. Now, I think that's important because we have a whole, we have a whole world, okay, a, a whole culture in which uh, we have atheists and unbelievers and so forth that uh, are trying to convince us that we can't trust what we see with our eyes. See, you and I as believers in the God, believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know what we see when we look outside the window? We see lemons producing lemons, cows producing cows, chickens producing chickens, monkeys producing monkeys, so on and so forth. That's, what, that's the substance and the evidence that God created that way in the beginning that you and I see when we look outside our window. But what does the atheist and the unbeliever and the evolutionist say to you? Well, I know that that's what you see with your eyes outside the window, but in reality, billions of years ago, See, now who's relying on blind faith? Our atheist friends, our evolutionary friends, or us? I submit, you, submit to you that the enemy, because he knows that the end is revealed out of the beginning, is out to corrupt and pervert the beginning. Because he knows if he can corrupt and pervert the beginning, then ostensibly what has he done? He has marred the picture and he's corrupted the end. So the constant struggle of creation and evolution will be constantly going on in our culture and in our society because the enemy knows that that's where the truth is and that's where the end is, is right out of the beginning because he's always going to be out to corrupt the beginning. And so God knew that and so he's going to restore those things from back uh, to the beginning in the latter days and you're participating in that right now. But I want to lay the foundation before you before we get into this beautiful language called Hebrew which once again I submit to you will dramatically change the way you look at the scriptures. From this point forward you will never see them in the same light you did before and I hope to give you the tools by which to dig these wonderful treasures up out of the ground as we learn this beautiful language and take it from Genesis to Revelation, okay? So in the meantime, cling to your roots that your days may be long and that you will prosper in everything you set your hand to do. Shalom Aleichem. See you next time. Well, there you go. The first of many videos hopefully to come in the future featuring Brad. I really dig his approach to theology but by no means do I agree 100% with everything that he says. But, nonetheless, I find his teachings to be inspiring, intriguing, thought-provoking, and sincere. If you enjoyed this little video featuring Brad Scott, and you're not already, why not hit that little subscribe button down there? Give us a little bit of love with that thumbs up right next door. And of course, Hit that share button down there and share this little video with any friends or family members that you think might enjoy watching or benefit from this teaching from Brad Scott. I'm looking forward to that fellowship down in them comments. Let's keep it kind, compassionate, and encouraging, please. And until next time, remember, Yeshua, Jesus loves you. And so do I. Now get off of here, bundle up, Go ride your bike and read your Bible.